everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we are talking to Joanne DiMaggio and we're talking about this book, Edward Casey and the Unfulfilled Destiny of Thomas Jefferson Reborn. <laughs> this is such an interesting idea. Um, so welcome, Joanne. Thank so you. tell me how you got involved in this work. I, I went to your website and it seems like you have done past life regressions yourself. You've gone through trainings for the last basically 30 years working with this material. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about um, your curiosity, why this material and how you um, came upon this book. Well, um, I joined the ARE, Edgar Casey's ARE Association for Research and Enlightenment back in 1987, which was right around the time that um, Shirley MacLaine's book, Out on a Limb, became a miniseries mm. on ABC for two nights. And so I had an interest in reincarnation as a teenager and read some books about it, read about Edgar Casey. So after I joined the ARE, after I saw the uh, miniseries, um, she, and, and Shirley was talking about reincarnation, it really brought all that interest back up in me again. So right around the time that I joined the ARE, I had a friend of mine who knew I was, um, I always considered myself a reporter for the universe. I, I just, <laughs> I'm a writer more so than anything else. And I love a good story and I love to, to do research. And she said to me, did you know that Edgar Casey did a reading on a baby boy when he was only two days old and said that he was the reincarnation of Thomas Jefferson and Alexander the Great. So he had two, two big ones. And I, and I was intrigued and she gave me the, the reading number because all of the people that have had readings from Edgar Casey have a number assigned to them to, to preserve their anonymity. So I looked up, it's 1208, if you're an ARE member, you could look it up. I, I looked it up and I read about it and I thought, wow, what is that like to have been two days old and to be told that you were Thomas, not that, it, not that at two days old you know what that was about, but certainly later on. And uh, I, th I knew that he hadn't done, he hadn't accomplished what uh, Casey had said, which was that this soul would do for the world what Jefferson did for this country. So not wow. only did he tell him that he was Jefferson, but he's also telling him, hey, you know, you're going to do something tremendous for the world at large. So I knew that hadn't happened. And I thought, well, this is an interesting story. I want to find out why it didn't mm. happen. Well, it took many, many, many years before we connected. Uh, we didn't really connect until 1996. Uh, when I found out that he actually was living in this, he was living 13 miles away from me in the same town that I live in. Yeah, in, here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, where we both still live. And, um, and so... Uh, Wait, he's we, still alive. Thankfully, yes, he is. He'll be 85 next month. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So we met and, um, you know, we didn't talk about a biography at that time. Uh, and then our paths went separate ways. So we didn't see each other for like eight or nine years. And then we came together again when I started doing ARE programs at my local Unity Church. He came to one of those. So, um, so then we started talking again and I said, would you, how do you feel about me writing your biography? I really would like to share with people what happened. And because he, he had sort of taken a beating about that. People thought very uh, um, low of him because he didn't fulfill that prophecy and it was always being thrown in his face and so i said i would really love to talk to you and so i i got him to agree to do some conversations with um little little small meetings with are people where he felt he could open up and uh i i uh, transcribed those then i had private interviews with him and then he gave me permission to go into the Edgar Casey archives and to uh, research his files uh, there in the vault at the ARE in Virginia Beach. And I did that on and off, it took eight years. Wait, so before... these are beyond the reading 1208, they're actually specific case notes that um, Edward Casey- There are, there about. are, there, there's a, a, TJ has a file in the archives and it's in the vault and it's about three feet deep and it has everything in there. It has his, all the 
all the pictures he drew when he was little. It has his, his report cards in there. But most of all was the letters that went back and forth between Edgar Casey, TJ's parents, uh, TJ's aunt Gladys Davis, who is Edgar Casey's secretary. Uh, you know, there are letters from her, uh, and letters from his parents. So I, I just went through all of those letters from like 1935 to 1945. And then I sandwiched them together and created a timeline for him. And, and in those letters, I let them, I let all those people have their own voice so you could hear them. And uh, they talked about their lives and what was going on. What was the socioeconomic situation like coming out of the depression, going into World War II? Um, you know, and then the personalities of his parents and the love that Mr. Casey had for this little baby who ended up living with him on and off for the first eight and a half years of his life. So it was a, it was, um, it was a tremendous undertaking and, uh, uh, it w underwent like five or six different different rewrites to it, but I had some help from TJ's uh, cousin-in-law who actually worked in the in the vault in the Edgar Casey Foundation, and she would bring out the files to me, and I had to put white gloves on and go through them, you know. So the researcher in me was just in heaven. I was so joyful, but it wasn't, you know, it was a, a hard task to to put all this together in some sort of a logical sequence. Um, I really wanted, and so did his cousin Karen, we wanted to make sure everything in the book was based on historical documentation. So, uh, because I didn't want anybody to point to something and say, I could prove, you know, that's not true because then I could say, well, I could prove that it was true and then go to the go to the archives and, and, and show where it was true. So, um, so that's what took so long. It was just very painstaking work putting it together. And out of that, you know, everybody came alive to me. I felt like I was sharing my house with his, with Edgar and Gladys and TJ's parents and his grandparents. And, you know, it was just uh, uh, a real interesting uh, project for me to, to, to finish. It's the first biography I've written. So I was really proud of it. So you've written several other books because you yourself and um, someone can help people actually get a sense of their past lives, um, their story. Um, tell me a little bit about how your personal experience helped shape and mold, um, or if any, impacted this body of work. Well, um, I had I had hints about my own past life journey mm -hmm. uh, from the time I was a child also. And um, so um, when I became a member of ARE, uh, I was living in Chicago at the time and I became part of the ARE Heartland region. So I was actually on the core team and they would bring in speakers from all over. And many of those speakers were past life specialists. Can I ask a couple of question, clarifying questions? Cause I don't know, I realize I don't know anything about Edward Casey and I know that it's research and, and enlightenment, but I can't remember what's the A stand for? Association. Oh, Association of Research and Enlightenment. Or Association for Research and Enlightenment. And so was it primarily about past lives or no, what was- not at all. Edgar Cayce was considered the most renowned psychic of the 20th century. And in his lifetime, he gave 14,000 readings. So people would come to him from all over, write him letters and say, you know, that, that they were asking him questions, mostly about their health issues. Mm -hmm. And he would go into trance and then out of those 14,000 readings, 12,000 of those were health readings. That's why he earned the title of father of holistic medicine, because he was, he was giving everybody a, um, a remedy for what was going on with them because traditional medicine was not helping them. So, um, and he was so far ahead of his time, really. We're only catching up to him now. And many of his remedies, you, you could still get them. The, the original recipes that he gave are still being made and sold. Wow. By, uh, yeah. So, um, but all of a sudden somebody asked him a question and the answer that he gave had to do with their past lives, which was a shock to Casey because you know, he'd been doing all these health readings and all of a sudden he's talking about this person's past life. 
And actually for a few weeks, he stopped doing readings because it's, it, it upset him mm. because he was a, a very devout Christian. You know, he taught Sunday school and he read the Bible for every year of his life. He read the Bible once a year. And, um, you know, so to start talking about reincarnation, he was like, what is this? Uh, and it took a while before he, he became comfortable with it and knew that he wasn't harming anybody because that was his main thing. He thought, if I ever do anything that hurts anybody, I'm going to stop this work. But thankfully, that didn't happen. And then all of a sudden, now we've got a whole treasure trove of readings that have to do with esoteric philosophies. So, you know, uh, everything I've learned about reincarnation, I learned from Mr. Casey. But that wasn't the only thing he spoke of, obviously, but that's what I zeroed in on. Uh, and he gave over 2000 of those life readings. So when little TJ was born uh, and Gladys, his Aunt Gladys brought him to Mr. Casey because they thought the baby was gonna die. And Casey said, bring him to me and I'll take care of him. So he gave him the reading and told Gladys what to do to save the baby's life uh, because he had been in his mother's womb for uh, those nine months and it was consisted of nothing but alcohol because she was an alcoholic. So he said when he was born, he was like a piece of wood, he said, you know, and they didn't give him more than three days to live. But he, Mr. Casey said, give him carnation milk, he'll be fine. They did, and he was. And, uh, but that's when the, the, the reading about, you know, who he had been in a previous life, he gave him four past life uh, identities. And of course, the two that are the foremost were Alexander and um, and Thomas Jefferson, but he also gave him a past life uh, in Atlantis and he gave at the time of the destruction and he gave him a past life as one of the uh, individuals who was instrumental in uh, developing the, um, the government of early France. Wow. So, um, so he's, those are the four that he was given, although he's had many, many more than that. We all have. And, uh, and then how, and I know that you do these readings yourself for clients, how do you determine which ones shape the arc of your current life? Well, when I do a past life regression, uh, I don't do a reading per se, because readings tend to to give people information. And I, I'm not a psychic. I don't say you were Cleopatra in a previous life. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe all the information lies within the soul. And so I just act as a guide. And I use regression therapy, uh, which is equivalent to hypnosis or guided imagery to get them into a very relaxed state. Then I lead them uh, you know, uh, to their past life, the, the past life that is most impacting them today. That's the one that we're looking for. And that's the one that the soul usually brings up for them. And so we examine that life to see what are the issues, what are the attributes that they brought in with them is unfinished business in this life and how we can apply it for healing purposes. It's a very powerful, powerful tool of transformation. And most people only need one session. It's not like traditional psychotherapy where you come back week after week after week to work on an issue. If it's past life related, we usually get it that very first time and then that's it. Okay, so let's say that. So if I were a client, I would come to you. You would, you, we would be working together, talking. You would put me into a state where I could actually myself draw upon my past lives for up to four or is no it when i do them it's only one okay so one past life yeah, that yeah. is um, most impacting impacting you. you today and then generally when you do that um you get the sense of like the attributes unfinished business those are the kind of qualitative things that you get from the client that the client draws about their own past life yeah i mean they know what they know what their issues are in this life they know what they're working on in a way you know i'm dealing with abandonment in this life or i'm dealing with a relationship issue or i have a chronic condition that i don't know the source of it yeah health condition like right there's twelve thousand right. people right so we go back to the origin of it they see where it began and then, you know, we talk about, we, I, they stay in that lifetime as long as they want to stay in it, where we just keep looking and looking and examining different aspects of it. 
and then we talk about their death and then what were their last thoughts when they died because that often sets up the next lifetime yeah. uh, and then we talk about um, what behavior patterns are the same in this life that we're in that life you know what do you have in common with your past life personality and um, and then who in that lifetime are in your life now recognize the same souls. They, they may look different in this life. They might be a different gender and they're in a different role than they were in before, but it's the same soul. So who, who in this life feels like somebody from that other life? And then why are they here with you now? What role are they playing? So we examine all of that. That's a traditional past life regression. Uh, I've added on different, I, I, I've got two or three others that I do, one specifically for physical conditions, uh, physical karma. And then I do one if they wanna examine the afterlife planning session, like right before you became who you are today, when you were in the afterlife and your soul was planning this life, um, what was that like? And so we examine all aspects of that planning session. That's like before you incarnate as a soul, you have like a mission um, and does it include the similar kinds of attributes like the behavioral patterns, the who in your life comes? Yeah, when, the, when we look at the afterlife, we look at um, what are your, what are the karmic issues that you brought, that you're bringing into the next life? Mm -hmm. But what are the karmic attributes that you've earned that are gonna help you deal with those issues? Why did you pick the parents that you have? Because that's, mm -hmm. our, that's our choice. Uh, who met, what members of your soul family have come in with you and why? And because, you know, we travel as a soul pod, the same group of souls have been with us from the very beginning, but we keep changing roles and we keep changing genders. Mm. So your mother in this life could have been your husband in a previous life, Got but it. the soul is the same. We talk about which ones of those, which souls have come in. Um, and then what is your soul's mission in this life? Why are you here? Which is a one of the major questions people ask when they want to do a regression. And, um, you know, why did you choose the body that you have now? And do you have any memory triggers from that, from, uh, uh, that life in this life now? You know, like some people, you hear a piece of music and all of a sudden you get a flash of, of another time in another place. Mm -hmm. um, so we look at all of that uh, and we're able to piece together you know, uh, sort of somewhat of a mosaic, you know, that, that results in the person that you are today. Okay. So what, what's so interesting, I remember, um, James on Prague, who is, um, a medium right. and he said, you know, when everyone does past life regressions, they always end up being like Cleopatra or King Tut, like it's someone really interesting versus like, my past life was the guy who made shoes, you know, next door to, you know, there's no, there was never anything that's, it's always these extraordinary Thomas Jefferson, Alexander, the great, I mean, is that, is that's that, rare. Is, is it a re, yeah. So when you act, when you've actually done these, and if you've looked over the course of the 14,000 readings that Edward Casey has done, how often do you get this kind of um, thing that TJ had, which is like Thomas Jefferson, Alexander the Great, the guy from, you know, historically, all these different things, like how often is that the case? Well, with Casey, you have to remember he was the exception because um, of who he was mm -hmm. and people coming to him. And so uh, when he gave a past life reading, very often there would be somebody famous that would pop up because all of those souls are, are yearning for answers and who would they go to? They'd go to, to Casey. They were lucky they had him at the time. In my career of 34 years of doing this work, I can count on one hand the number of famous people that I've encountered. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there are people who claim to be the same person. Like ever since my book came out, I've had several other Thomas Jeffersons <laughs> come forward to tell me that I was I was doing a disservice to humanity because I wasn't mentioning them okay uh, but uh but a lot of times you know it's based on ego mm -hmm. I had a woman come to me and said she was um she was sure she had been Patrick Henry 
And I said, what makes you say you were Patrick Henry? She said, well, he's a good talker and so am I. Okay, good. There's a lot more to it than that. And then how often does that influence your your past life regression? If in their egoic mind, I'm like someone like Cleopatra or Patrick Henry or whomever, how does that affect um, the reading that you get? Well, I don't, I never negate anybody's experience. I mean, it it may be symbolic of something. And the the one thing I tell people, like say that you think you're Napoleon. Mm -hmm. So I would say to them, well, are you looking at the world from atop your horse through your eyes? Or are you in the crowd? Because Mm. remember that there are famous people have so many hundreds and thousands of people in their circle, Mm -hmm. right? Who, Who either saw them at some point, in that past life, they lived in that same past life, but they, um, they, they identified with this person for some reason. Mm. Uh, And so suddenly they take on that persona. Um, You know, so if you if you're looking at Napoleon sitting on a horse, then you obviously you are not Napoleon. Right, right, right. But you feel a resonance with Napoleon and whatever he said during that point. So you may feel like, oh, I have a connection with Napoleon, which you do because you saw yeah. him sitting riding a horse. I see. Yeah. So then, so then you you kind of like use that as a launching point to get a sense of of that person's regression and such. So, right. and you talk about in your website that you do writing. So, oh, is right. it is that actually writing up the notes from your session or something different? No, soul writing is a written form of meditation. Uh, it's something I learned from Edgar Casey. As a matter of fact, I, I based my uh, my thesis on on this. Edgar Casey called it inspirational writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people call it automatic writing. It's neither. It's soul writing. Is um, say that you know you think of prayer as you talking to God, mm-hmm. meditation is God talking to you. Well, soul writing is you taking notes. So you're writing in an altered state of consciousness. So you go through the same process you do when you're going to do a meditation. Mm -hmm. And then once you get to that point, you know, going to this very relaxed state, some deep breaths, surrounding yourself with white light, saying a prayer of protection, putting the pen in your hand, and then waiting for spirit to to communicate. You can either ask a question of spirit or spirit can just communicate with you. So I use it. uh, I wrote a I wrote two books about it. One was soul writing, which was my, my thesis. And the second one was your soul remembers, which was teaching people how to use soul writing to get past life information. Cause there's many ways you can apply it to your life. So I do teach that uh, as well as doing the regressions. But so it's that's different it than automatic writing or inspirational writing. Inspirational writing is what Casey called it, but that was back in the thirties and forties. And if you typed in inspirational writing now in Amazon, you would get all Christian genre books. Uh, if you okay. type in automatic writing, you're going to get occult books. So soul writing is neither one of those. I, I renamed it soul writing when I did my thesis because I realized that neither one of those terms was, was adequate anymore. And so I thought, well, what is it? And I realized it's writing this co- it's, it's, it's divinely inspired. It's coming from above, through you, through your soul and out your hand onto the paper. So uh, it is very different from automatic writing. And I have indicated in my books, um, the difference between the two. So I do include automatic writing. I mean, I'm sorry. Soul writing. Soul writing when I'm doing regressions. Uh, People have a choice. They could either do just the traditional regression. If they want to go a little deeper, then we'll add the soul writing after the regression. And what that does is sometimes it'll give you the backstory of something you didn't get in the regression. It'll answer a question or it'll tell you, how do I apply this information? You know, you're done with the regression and going, now what am I supposed to do? Uh, sometimes the soul writing will point you in the direction, offering you the guidance. This is what, this is where you go next. With it. Okay. Got it. So do you do the soul writing on the behalf of the person or you guide the person to write this out. You do the solo. We do it together. They, I teach them how to do it. So when, while they're writing, I'm writing too. So I'm contacting my friends upstairs and I'm saying, is there any information you can give me on behalf of so-and-so? 
Okay, so, so you then, hear a dialogue and I would hear a dialogue and so we would both be writing together. But it would be different dialogue. You're, you're getting something different than I'm getting. Right. Uh, and then we compare what, what we've got. Oh, how fun. Oh, that yeah. must be great fun. Okay, so you have Thomas, um, you have um, Edward Casey who in a two-year-old, he's not doing this kind of connection. He comes up with these four lifetimes for TJ and... Um, so now TJ has these like incredible, probably, I don't know, like expectations laden on him on yeah. what and who he should be. He's going to right. do what Thomas Jefferson did for the country, for the world. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of a big to-do list. Yeah. Um, so when you talk to him, um, what, how did that affect him and how, and you talk about the role of like, how come he, you know, why didn't he do that? What would you, what did you find were some of the reasons why not and how that affected him? Well, Edgar Casey gave uh, very specific instructions on how he was supposed to be raised. Mm -hmm. Now he came in through Boyd and Berlin Davis who were both alcoholics and heavy gamblers. Mm. The last thing they wanted was a baby. Mm. And so uh, that's why uh, Boyd, TJ's father Boyd was the brother of Gladys Davis so Gladys asked if she could bring the baby to the Casey's and they said sure take him and he took him over and that's when they named him Mr. Oh, so Casey. it wasn't Gladys's son this is her brother oh, no this is her nephew wow okay got it okay got it's it her nephew, right. right um See, TJ wanted to be with Mr. Casey when he was still in spirit. He was kind of looking down going, I, I, wanna, I wanna have another lifetime with him because they had shared many, many lifetimes together. So he's looking down or whatever you wanna say from the afterlife and he's going, you know, I really wanna be with Mr. Casey. Oh, too late, Mr. Casey's too old. He's not having any children. I'll come in through my Aunt Gladys. Nope, can't do that. She's not married or having children. So he thinks the next best thing is I'll come in through Gladys's brother and his wife because they won't want me because they don't want their lifestyle is such that they're not going to want a baby and that's exactly what happened so she, Gladys goes over there and brings them over to Mr. Casey's home and then over the next eight and a half years TJ spent not constantly with the Casey's but on and off on and off on and off sometimes he'd spend months there and all of a sudden his mother would say oh I want him back and then he'd go back but Mr. Casey gave very explicit instructions on how he was to be raised, the education especially that he was supposed to get. Uh, and in his growing up years, he spent on the pier fishing. They had a, a lake in the back of Mr. Casey's home and they would go out on the pier fishing. And Mr. Casey was teaching TJ at the age of two teaching him about reincarnation and the and the, the creation story and how to read auras and um, and karma and grace and all of this stuff. He was pouring all of this wisdom into the vessel of this little boy that he loved so dearly, preparing him for this work that was ahead of him and giving his parents advice. He needs to go to this school. He needs this. They completely ignored Casey's advice. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so Casey had told TJ and his family, I'll give him a second life reading when he's 13. Well, he died when uh, TJ was only eight and a half. So he never got that second reading. And when Casey died, TJ's life just abruptly changed oh. because nobody took him in to, to uh, mentor him anymore. Uh, he was thrown from pillar to post. Nobody really wanted to be responsible for him. Gladys couldn't watch him all the time because she was trying to save the readings and save the ARE. Now that Casey was gone, his parents still didn't want him. He didn't see his father for years at a time. His wow. father went off to World War II and was gone for years. Um, and his mother, you know, she was, she was still living a, a life of... Uh, uh, you know, she was a hostess in these, these clubs and um, she really didn't have the lifestyle or the stability to be a mother to him. So he was thrown from pillar to post and never got the education that Mr. Casey had outlined for him and all the things that Casey had said to do, they just didn't do it. Mm. And at that point, he just, he went off the rails. 
he his his soul took a whole different trajectory now granted he could have at the age of maybe 18 you know when you're eight when you're eight or nine years old you cannot say you cannot say i i, I my life has to go this way i need this education or i need to do this so you sort of forgive him from the time that he's like nine until he's maybe 18. But when he was 18 and he knew, he knew what Casey had said about him and he knew what he was supposed to do. And he just, at that point, he was so lost. He said that he just didn't, um, he didn't pursue it. He became sort of like a hippie, hippie-ish kind of guy, later became more of a, of a recluse. I think that they felt he was an embarrassment mm -hmm. to the ARE. Uh, and so, um, you know, he pretty much just went off on it on uh, in a whole different on a whole different path mm. that and so he never uh, he never did. Do, he didn't do anything really um, that remotely resembled what Casey had in mind for him. Mm. What was what has been his sacred work then that he has done? Like if, if you have free will. So what you're saying is he chose free will to decide his own life path, which was not to follow the vision that Edward Casey had for him. And he decided to be a hippie. What was his work then? Well, he always wanted to do the Casey work. Hmm. Deep down inside, that's what he wanted to do. And no job that he had ever, he never had a career as such. Mm -hmm. uh, no job that he had was ever close to doing that work. I think the closest he came was when he worked at the Heritage Store in Virginia Beach because they sold the Casey Remedies. Mm -hmm. But he never got a job at the ARE. They never hired him there, even though he mm -hmm. he said, I'll do it, I'll, I'll just cut the grass. I just wanna be near the readings and near this work. And, and they said no to him. And um, mm -hmm. so he, be, like I said, he had a whole list of, uh, of jobs, uh, he got married multiple times, had children. Um, you know, he worked in retail. Uh, he worked in uh, uh, clothing stores. He shoe stores. Um, he was a DJ for a while. And the last job that he had here in Charlottesville is he was roasting coffee. Wow. You know, so he never. But you know what? I honestly believe that the work that Casey was talking about about doing for the world what Jefferson did for this country had nothing to do with Thomas Jefferson. And it had nothing to do with a global political initiative. I truly believe what Casey meant was that TJ was being prepared to share the Casey readings, the wisdom of those readings. Because he has said to me many times, he said, you know, Joanne, everything that humanity wants to know is in those readings. All the answers in, are, in, are in the in his readings. own readings because he was doing a reading for TJ and you're saying when he was conveying that information, it's all there in his readings. Not, no, they're not in TJ's readings. They're in the overall readings that Casey did. Ah, the 14,000 readings. Yeah, like if you yeah. study the 14,000. If you study the readings, especially those 2,000 that were life readings, you would get answers to all the questions you you have about and the world would be a completely different place if everybody had those answers mm. so i really think because you know what when tj was little casey they didn't talk about thomas jefferson i mean it would come up because i mean when when tj was three years old he started reciting the declaration of independence to mr casey and he said i wrote that you know i mean so he had some bleed through coming up throughout his childhood and everybody at the ARE knew who he had been and they were always watching for signs, you know, mm. of, of, uh, of Jefferson to come forward or Alexander. Uh, although TJ does not like the Alexander life because, because he said, there's nothing great about Alexander because he killed so many people. So it's a, you know, that's one of the things he, he's, uh, uh, embarrassed about actually. Mm. Uh, the issue with with Thomas Jefferson, the issue that he has a hard time with is slavery issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so there are things about those lives that he's not exactly proud of. And also he doesn't go around bragging. Oh, I, you know, I was Thomas Jefferson. He, he's very humble when it comes to that, which is also to me a sign of it being real because a lot of these other Jefferson wannabes 
they well, are, they're well, you're close to Monticello too, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Has he been there? Yeah, oh yeah. It's and it's right across the way from where he's living now. He lives <laughs> up. He lives up on a mountain, and he takes his. He was when he first moved there. He was taking his binoculars, and he's looking, and he says he sees all these people roaming around. He he has some funny stories about Monticello, which are in the book. There's one in particular. Uh, the Fourth of July every year. Um, Monticello has a naturalization ceremony for new citizens. Oh, sweet. And, and, uh, and he said, when he said, well, I wanted to go and see, he's once in a while, I want to see that I did some good somewhere. So he wanted to go to see this, right? So he drives up there, but he went up late because uh, it's open to the public, it's free. So they always get a big crowd. And he got there late and the, the attend, parking attendant said, I'm sorry, you can't stay. There's no place for you to park. And TJ said, what do you mean? I'm Thomas Jefferson. What do you mean I can't park here? And uh, the parking attendant said, I'm sorry, Mr. Jefferson, but you'll have to leave. <laughs> and so he didn't want to say, hey, this is my house, you know, uh, right. because he said, I didn't want them to throw me in the mental institution. But uh, but he has a lot of interesting stories like yeah. that. He hasn't been there in many, many years, though. So. He lives in the shadow, but he hasn't been there in years. So in your own work, you know, because you've been working with people yourself doing past life regressions and um, the lifetime work planning, I think you called them planning, pre -plan, pre -life after life planning yeah. and soul writing. I mean, what does this mean? So you're doing these readings and the presumption is that these things may impact you, but it's all depending upon your choices and decisions, right? Is from what I can tell from the TJ's experience, is that no, I mean, I mean, what's your main takeaways from, right? You know, spending eight years writing this book and reading through the notes. I mean, what? How have you lived your life differently? Uh, me personally, mm -hmm. um, I learned something from every person that I work with, whether they were famous or not in a previous mm -hmm. lifetime. Um, and there's a thread that runs through all of these. And when I do the, the work where we're looking at the pre-life planning session, I named, when I did my research on that topic, all my books, by the way, are based on research projects. Uh, and this one, the one I did on the pre-life planning session was called, I did it to myself again. And the reason I called it that was because so many people would come to me for regressions, but they would come in there, they would blame, oh, it's my parents' fault, it's my spouse's fault, it's my children's fault that my life is like this. And, the, the, and I knew the answer was, no, no, it's you planned it this way. You set it up so that you would deal with this issue because this is part of your karmic journey. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, you can change your mind. It, you might be on a trajectory you can, you free will, you can go off on another direction. TJ certainly did. In his heart of hearts, he didn't really want to do that. I don't think he consciously did that. But um, you have the free will, you can do it, but there's consequences. So if, if you know what your, your life's plan is, if you know what your soul's mission is in this life, like why did you come? You know, did you come to teach? Did you come to heal? You know, did you come to, um, I don't know, any, any number of reasons just to love? I mean, people listed a lot of reasons. You could choose not to do that at any point in time. So it's, it, there is not a sense of predestination. It's not like this is written in, in, in concrete. Now you cannot change it. You can always change it. Inevitably, you learn things that enable your soul to grow. Like Mr. Casey, when he would give a reading, he would say, in this life, the soul gained, or in this life, the soul lost. Mm -hmm. So depending on what you're doing, you know, you're, you're on this road to return home to, mm -hmm. to the creator, to be a companion to the creator. You've come to the earth to experience everything that being in a human body would offer you because we're spiritual beings inhabiting a human body so there's only things we can learn on the earth we can't learn them anyplace else because this is the this is the realm that we can learn about those relationship issues and 
and uh, uh, develop sk skills and talents and abilities that you can take with you, you know, one so one lifetime after the other. So it's a learning experience. I, I think of it as school. You know, we're we're all students. The earth is a school. We have come with our, our curriculum for this lifetime, and you know, if you don't finish the course, guess what? You're going to have to repeat it. So it's best to finish it and get it over with. But TJ always laughs. He goes, I know I'm coming back. I said, well, so am I. So, well, you know, but I won't have to write about you again because I've already done it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have, we have like a plan, right? Whether we execute the plan or diverge from the plan and do our own plan, there are going to be consequences. So the consequence of going to on the plan is your soul grows, you learn something. I mean, what are the consequences of going on plan and going off plan? Because TJ is an off plan scenario, right? He yeah. chose not to. Yeah, I think, you know, you can go on a detour. Yeah. Eventually yeah. you're gonna come right back. Okay, so if you go off plan, it's like, guess what? You're coming back with the same darn plan. Same so yeah. you, you have to decide. To, <laughs> yeah, you didn't bother to learn it. You know, uh -huh. I'll give you I'll give you an example. Jefferson had a terrible time managing money. Mm. He just, you know, he had he died bankrupt. In this lifetime, TJ is living in pretty much abject poverty. Uh, he's living off of a social security check that basically covers his mortgage and he doesn't much have anything left after that. So that's a direct result of, of deal. You know, okay, I'm working on learning how to manage money because I really blew it in my last life, right? So I'm working on that. Uh, the slavery issue, all right? Jefferson had slaves. In this lifetime, TJ absolutely has no, um, he doesn't have a racist bone in his body, believe me. And uh, he, when he was, uh, pretty young, uh, he became one of the first uh, Caucasian young men in, in the Virginia Beach area to join the NAACP. Mm -hmm. that's, in, that's in my book. Uh, so, um, and his family, he has a branch of his family that's from Selma. So when all of that uh, race riots and stuff was happening, you know, it hit him pretty hard. Uh, so he's, you know, that's an issue that he's working on in this life as well. Uh, so, okay. Cause uh, so there could be other, so like changing the world, like Thomas Jefferson, like, okay, maybe not this lifetime, but he is working on some of the other issues that could be worked through in his life plan, like money issues, slavery. But there those could are be personal. Other those are personal. He's working through them personally. Those are not impacting other people. What Casey was talking about was that whatever he was going to do was going to have worldwide reach. Right, but he's uh, but he is doing something according to his. Well, he's plan. working on he's working on his some of his karma for sure. But like I said, uh, I really think that the Casey reading had to do with sharing the Casey uh, philosophy, and you know his his health is starting to fail, mm -hmm. and uh, I really feel like if I could get him on, uh, he wants to do a YouTube uh, channel. He wants to. He did. Uh, join me once when I gave a talk for ARE here in Charlottesville at Unity Church. He he sat with me while I was going over the book and doing my slot PowerPoint, and then he would add something. And having him there because he's a treasure. Because there are no mm. there are no um, nobody's left who had a life reading from Casey who actually knew Edgar Casey. There's no. Mm. So um, having him as a, somebody that actually lived with Mr. Casey, the stories that he would tell about fairies in the garden, about manifesting this little girl playing the violin on the pier and, and she became his friend of uh, uh, learning how to read the auras, learning the creation story. Uh, he, saw the, he saw Casey levitate somebody once. Wow. Uh, he heard Michael the Archangel coming through Casey. I mean, he his stories are 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 incredible. Uh, and his travels in Europe after he got out of the Marine Corps uh, 
a lot of his past life bleed through, especially Alexander came through Mm -hmm. and he shares those stories with people. So, Mm -hmm. um, and you know what, he still has so much charisma when people are around, they hang on every word that he says, Mm -hmm. you know, you would think that somebody, I don't know if it's because they, they know he was Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson think, oh, I want to hear what he has to say. Um, but I really still think, and he does too, we've talked about this, that the um, that the main reason he was here w- was to carry on the Casey legacy, mm-hmm. uh, which he can still do if he chooses to. Yeah, so it's never too late. You're saying he's never too late. Old. He's made a whole bunch of choices throughout his entire lifetime that has not right. necessarily been to fulfill this um, vision or potentiality that he had. Right. Um, right. It's never too late. I mean, you can no. be 85 and still change. And so for him to have his soul grow, so there's a choice of, okay, I've decided not to go down this. I know you've set up a whole curriculum for me. No, thanks. I'm going to make a series of choices and with my free will not to do those things. What happens when you decide to do those things? Like, you know, do do gates fall, you know, opportunities fall right open? Like what happens when you're like, yes, I'm moving forward. What, what's the path? The meet, the universal meets you halfway. There's such a, you know, you'll, you'll find a bunch of synchronicities that will happen that will open doors for you. Um, you know, I've always thought my mission is to be a reporter for the universe. So the way I describe that is I came here to write, to observe what's going on around me and then write about it and then disseminate that information to large audiences. Mm -hmm. That is where my true joy is, which is why the soul writing is, um, is, is my great joy. Uh, to do something like that. So all, that's why all my books are based on research topics. So, uh, or, um, you know, I, I'll organize conferences or I'll organize uh, talks, but then I'm doing the one-on-one with people as well. And, um, and I've been able now through Zoom, I've been able to work with people all over the world doing regressions because I do them on mm-hmm. Zoom. Mm. And it's actually much more effective than when I had an office, believe it or not. Interesting. These people are very comfortable in their own homes. And so they can relax better. There's Mm. no distractions. They don't get all pent up because they're getting in a car and they got to drive. I don't know how long to get to my office. And then they're in a strange place. And, you know, we do the session and then they have all this anxiety driving home. I have had tremendous luck, uh, success with zoom uh and do people remember what they say in the zoom impressions they do they remember and then i send them a written transcript which i don't know that any other past life therapist does that but i always i try to record them but spirit erases my recordings every time i don't know why they do that but they do so i gave up and i just say (laughs) okay I'll take notes and I'll, and I'll write up, uh, luckily I take shorthand. So I keep up with everybody. And, That's uh, hilarious. Okay. I so know. you've tried to record it and they just don't say, not it. only have I tried, but other people have tried too, and they don't get anything either. Wow. <laughs> it's like silence. And so I think, okay, how about if I do a written regret, a written transcript for you? Yeah. And so I offer all of my clients a written transcript. That's so they fantastic. Can go back and read it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So um, any other key takeaways, I mean, from your own perspective about um, this book and how it changed either the way that you do work or additional insights, or is it just affirming for what you already knew? Well, I felt that there was a big injustice that happened then, and I think people weren't asking the right questions. And so mm. the reporter part of me wanted to get to the bottom of it and I wanted to vindicate him Mm. because I felt that I'll I'll be honest with you uh knowing him has been uh a real deep profound pleasure for me we've been together in other lifetimes so we know each other on a on a deep soul level and so I feel like I made this promise to him before we even got into a physical body, like when we were still in the afterlife, I said, oh, all right, I'll write this book. 
And so, you know, I feel like I fulfilled my promise to him. Uh, but I feel like also that um, not to judge people by what they have or have not done, because mm. you don't know the story. You don't know what's going on. He's been the victim of, of a lot of gossip. Uh, a lot of uh, lies been told about him. Uh, if you were to sit and talk to him, uh, you would find him to be one of the most engaging uh, men that you've ever spoken to. The, and his deep love of Edgar Casey and of the Casey work, I think, and his perspectives on it, because it's unlike anybody else's, because he lived with the man. Uh, I think makes, makes him a treasure and I'm very, very happy and, and humbled by the, the fact that I was able to, to do the story in a way that honored him mm. and honored Edgar Casey, and showed people that past life work is not always a straight up, you know, you, ha you can have a very lofty life and then go down and have a, a life that's not so lofty and then go back up again. So it's like this, um, but it depends on what you're working on karmically. So, um, so it's been- it Life that are like this, is that because um, they got lost along the plan that they weren't following their values or their mission? What causes this? They, they may have decided that in that, um, see, you know, when you're in that pre-life planning session, you're looking at all your past lives and you're saying, well, because many of the people in my study, they went back to a past life that happened a thousand years ago. And only now they were working on those issues and they had many lifetimes in between. Because you look at when you're picking out your parents, you're picking out your socioeconomic conditions that you're going to be born into. So you know what nationality you're going to be, you know what race you're going to be, you know what religion you'll probably be brought up in, you know what country you're going to be living in. And you say to yourself, you know, the circumstances of this coming life would be perfect for me to work on this issue from this particular past life. All right. So it may not be so lofty because you may have issues from that other lifetime that you're going to have to dig in pretty deep to to work through mm -hmm. uh maybe a physical condition um you know who knows uh mm -hmm. you know you might have been somebody very wealthy and uh renowned in a previous life but let's say that that you were greedy mm -hmm. all right you didn't and so then many lifetimes goes by, you don't deal with it. And suddenly you go, you know, that lifetime when I was greedy, I think I'm going to work on that now. <laughs> What's going to happen now? You're going to be in poverty probably. Oh, no. Now. So I see. So it's, that's the way kind karma of... works. <laughs> <laughs> that's really effect. interesting. So yeah. the, so the, um, so the, the um, regression is like most influential life the after the pre-life planning feels like that's not necessarily pegged to a particular life it's just like the meeting is that right it's the meeting. no it does go it takes you first to a regression through to the particular lifetime uh okay in which in that case in the example that you just gave like it right. could be like thousands of year ago right. thousand years right. ago i did this thing yeah and that will take you like oh, that life. Take care of it. yeah right. you never really understood you're really greedy and you never understood what it meant the idea of greed that's yeah. what this life is about right interesting so then it would tell you all about these are the karmic issues attributes so it doesn't necessarily look at because when you talk to people in the kashic records they go through like you know they kind of look through all of your records and tell you like every past life and all this other such yours is kind of like let's just pick the one thing in which this was anchored to so you can kind of peg that is that or is there a reason why you think that that is more effective than when i've talked to akashic records they look across this series of all the past lives that you've had no but see i don't believe in that i don't believe that that you should give that power over to anybody else to tell you who you were and what you did and what happened you can go to the akashic records yourself you don't need to have uh, a reader and i also believe that that they're human and this information is getting sifted through them uh, and, you know, I have a really, really wonderful dear friend who's a, 
renowned psychic and she won't do readings for me because we're friends and she said it would be she would be influenced too much to do something for me i do not tell anybody anything i let them find that out for themselves because all the answers all the information about your past lives is stored in your soul it's there it's always been in there all you have to do is is be open to it and go uh, and get I it see. for so yourself. Like, so your philosophy is like it's within you. I'm going to teach you the techniques. I'll so take that you, you there. Can do yeah. I'll take you I'll there take so you, you can do this yeah. going forward. I'll take you there, and then you you uh, you find your own answers. I see. Yeah. So through your work, you would develop a methodology so that great one and done. I'm meeting up with Joanne. I'm learned how to do it. Now I can take this on my own and do this going forward. Well, no, I don't teach them how to do regressions. I, t I, I actually do the regression with them. Okay. They, in, in the course of our hour and a half or two hours or three hours together, they get all the information that they need. Uh, and then that's pretty much the end of it. I, I teach them how to do soul writing if they want to do go in deeper. But uh, I, I'm not negating anything that anybody would do in terms of an Akashic reader. Uh, those people are extremely special and talented. I'm not negating that. It's just that I've always felt that I'm not going to spoon feed anybody anything. That, you know, that information, it's called regression work, past life work, because it is work. It, <laughs> it's you needing to take responsibility for your own life. Right. And getting those answers yourself. And then applying them to your life so that you can learn and move forward. So Interesting. I love it. Okay. We've been talking to Joanne of DiMaggio about her book, Edgar Cayce and the Unfulfilled Destiny of Thomas Jefferson Reborn. Unfulfilled for as of the time this book was written. He still is 85. A lot can happen. Yeah. And the we, next we're 10 years. To, we're, we're hoping to fulfill that destiny. Exactly. Still. Yeah. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Thank you. I enjoyed it.